good. It is today, the day that you derive the formulas that we will use for the rest of the course. And whilst we might massage a bit later on, and whilst we might later in the course do things to it and realize that in fact what we derive today will have great deep ramifications throughout all of physics, day to day, the day on which we actually derive this result. Um, so, well, how are we going to, to get there? Let's get, take a conceptual step backwards and look at what we've done so far. Uh, well, what we have done is we've talked about constraints. We've talked about forces of constraint and we've talked about uh, what, what happens when you change coordinates to generalized coordinates. And 83 of you have answered a question. And the others still have to by 11.55 tonight. By the way, I'm very impressed. The average mark for the quiz is 87 cents so far. <laughs> so that's quite good. Um, so if the rest of you keep it up, then we're going to set quite a record in terms of the average here. Wow. Right, so basically, what began on Thursday as an observation about the limitations of Newtonian mechanics, what he of the mathematical language in which Newton expressed his laws is now going to, to become a, a new set of mechanical laws. And essentially, we have two goals, two objectives. And they are what? <laughs> to eliminate the forces of constraint. from our arguments. What do I mean? I mean when we study something like an inclined plane, currently we have to work out the normal force and then add up all the forces and solve the Newton's equation of motion. If instead of an inclined plane, we had an object moving in, uh, on some curved surface, the normal force is going to be excessively complicated. And considering it is a huge headache. And in fact, it's very difficult sometimes almost impossible to compute that normal force. So, let's not compute it. We know that the object isn't going to fall through the surface. Let's use that. Let's eliminate constraints from our dynamical arguments. Let's free ourselves from constraints. And uh, there's another kind of covert goal that's going along with this, and that's transformation and variance. The dynamical laws that we have so far are not transformation invariant. What do I mean? I mean the following. When you take Newton's laws and you write them down in, pole, in, in Cartesian coordinates, they look like mx double dot is equal to fx and my double dot is equal to fy. When you change coordinates and you write the same laws down in polar coordinates, suddenly the new terms it's not what it used to be. <coughs> so Newton's laws are not transformation invariant. And in Newton's construction, we have to consider constraints. Today, we're going to try and remedy all of that. We're going to try and build a mathematically beautiful, powerful formulation of that same mechanics that later will prove to be so deep, but that for now will solve these problems. How we'll do this is we'll follow Bernoulli. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce the other, the other gentleman's name, but I'll write it down. I think it's Berlin there. Frenchman. Anyone French here? Anyone speaks French? Pronounce this name. Are there? I'm not sure. So we're following the derivations of Bernoulli, D'Alembert, Goldstein, and ultimately, of course, Lagrange. And um, we're, we're going to follow the route of trying to eliminate these guys. There's another route called the variational approach. It's very, very beautiful. We'll do that too, for much later on. Um, and essentially, let's begin. We talked about constraints. Talked about. In fact, my hand doesn't go through this. So 
talked about the fact that the pendulum remains a constant distance from the origin as it swings. And we want to get rid of that. How do we go about it? How do we go about getting rid of constraints? We've already done something. What was it? Thursday, we talked about generalized coordinates. We talked about a way to reparameterize the position of an object with only a few smaller number of parameters, right? So we talked about characterizing where an object is with fewer parameters, so-called generalized coordinates, right? And generalized coordinates are basically any set of coordinates that can, one, completely tell me what configuration the system is in, and two, there are no constraints, holonomic constraints, relating the coordinates to each other. So there are a general set of coordinates, q1, qn, such that for every point in the, of the system of interest to me, I can write all the positions of all the particles in the system as a function of these coordinates, very general, But there's a very special relationship, and that is that these Q1s to Qn's are not constrained in any way. Not in any holonomic way. There's no equation you can write down that is a function of these equals zero. And that means you cannot any further reduce the degrees of freedom of the system, as we discussed on Thursday. So essentially, this is a way to eliminate constraints from our description of the system. Instead of saying, well, the possible positions of the bob of the pendulum are all those positions in the xy plane satisfying the relationship x squared plus y squared equals l squared. There's a constraint there, it's holonomic, and it's all sets of x and y. These are standard coordinates, they're not generalized. Instead of this, we change coordinates and we say, let's introduce a new generalized coordinate theta. And let's express x and y in terms of theta. We now have one coordinate and there are no constraints on theta. No holonomic constraints. We don't have some relationship like theta squared plus 2 is equal to 1. It's not true. Theta is allowed to vary within a range of parameters between 0 and 2 pi. There are no constraints on it. So that's the first step. The first step towards eliminating constraints is to introduce new coordinates, so-called generalized coordinates, in which my expressions of the possible configurations of the system are completely uh, general and, and obey no constraints. That's the point. But we're still missing something, something very important. Our dynamical laws themselves, right? That phrase f equals ma. Well, when I write f equals ma, what does it mean? What's this thing? <coughs> what is this thing? Is it the force of gravity? Force of friction is the normal force. What is it? All of it. All of it. In particular, it includes certain really annoying forces. The normal force, the force of tension. Things that we can't compute. The forces of constraint are part of this equation. So our dynamical laws themselves are not free from these constraints. The constraints are there. We have to reason about them. We have to solve for them. We don't want to have to do it. This was the motivation that led Bernoulli all these years ago, and, and, and our, our dear friend Dahl and Dare, all these years ago, led them to a new formulation, which we will now discuss. So we want to get rid of uh, the forces of constraint over here in our, our dynamical laws. That's the picture, right? But to do it, 
We have to think carefully about what's special about constraint forces that's not true about other forces. Constraint forces are special in some way. That way is we already know that the system's not allowed to lose out of those constraints. Can we formalize it? And yes, we can. I'm going to provide a few examples now. And uh, we're slowly going to see that something is special about constraint forces. And we're going to be able to use that special thing to get rid of it. I ain't saying it's going to be easy, but we are good. Right, so let's, let's consider a couple of uh, simple examples of um, situations where a constraint force is taking place. There's the classic one. Um, here's a box rolling down a, a plane, it's frictionless. It doesn't matter if it's frictionless in our case. Rolling down the plane. Which way does it move? So I'm gonna I'm gonna just write dr down because a little infinitesimal displacement of the system goes down. Which way is the, con the the constraint? What is the constraint here? Normal force. Which way is it pointing? Parallel perpendicular to the plane. Okay. I'm gonna ask a question. How much work does the normal force do? Right. Normal force isn't doing any work yet, they're at right angles. So when the system moves, the normal force is not doing any work. So a couple of, a couple of things that we're just going to talk about. We're going to talk about something called an infinitesimal displacement of the system. How you can think about this is, let's assume the physical world is playing like a movie in front of you. So if you play the movie, the block will slide down the slope. I can pause the movie, the block will pause. Then I can say it for a very short time, block the fly a little bit, and stop it again. And we can see what happened to the block in that very short time. Right, that's what I call an infinitesimal displacement. Infinitesimal displacement. Now, it's possible to reason about this thing happening to a system of particles. All that we do is we let the system play for a very short period of time and we watch what happens to every particle in the system over that period of time. So I'm just going to talk about play the movie. That's what an infinitesimal displacement can be thought of. Play the movie for a short time, see where everything ends up. So when we play the movie here, move that way. Normal force, that way. Okay, normal force isn't doing work. Have we caught on to something? Well, let's try a couple of other examples. I've got some complicated hoop structure, and I've put a bead on it. What's keeping the bead on the hoop? Or on the, on the, on the wire? What's keeping the bead there? It's a normal force again, right? The bead has got some interface with the wire, and the bead's not allowed to fall through the wire. That's just not allowed. Something's holding it there. It's a normal force. Which way does the normal force point? It points normal to the interface between the bead and the wire. Play the movie. What happens? Well, this one's a bit flat, so maybe I should have put the bead somewhere else. Let's put it there. Normal force this way. Play the movie. What happens? Down the wire. Actually, we're kind of chalk with each other, so let's make this work. Sort of.
tangent swings. When it swings in really small amounts, what's tangent? What's the tangential direction in which it moves? Right? So it's living on a circle. And when I swing at a very tiny amount, it'll move tangent to the circle, right? For a very, very, very short displacement of the, of the system. When I play the movie for a very short time. So I expect it to move to here, right? And what's the direction? Oops, I'm writing the wrong thing. Okay, so I don't know. What's happening? Is the tension force doing any work? Oh, okay, well we, we certainly are hitting on something. But um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna unfortunately bust all about that. Oh, we're thinking here, yeah, yeah, we've got something. Something is working out because the normal force isn't doing any work. Alright. When you stand in the lift, what's the force that moves you upward? Gravity? <laughs> so if you're standing in the lift, the lift moves up, something's pulling you up, what is it? It's the force that tells you I am going to fall through the floor of the lift. Right? When the lift moves upwards, gravity's point pulling you down, right? The only other force existing is the normal force. The lift moves up. Lift is moving. What force does the work? Ah, curve. We're in trouble. The normal force does the work. All of this is rubbish. The normal force is doing work. Right? Let's, let's think about the situation. Let's think about what happens. So, we have a lift. Let's say, let's, let's, let's be generous, let's say, oh, let's be a little bit less than generous. Let's say that I'm extremely short and fat and maybe approximated by a particle around your thing. Right. Play the movie. Lift goes up. So, when we play the movie for a short time, oh, the lift moves up. Particle has moved up, right? And so our, our little displacement of the particle. Okay, maybe maybe I'm walking around the lift as well. So maybe my displacement is not vertical. Maybe I'm just move slightly sideways, right? My displacement is from down here to up here. Okay, what's the force of constraint? The force of constraint is the normal force. Pointing vertically upwards. Does the normal force do work? Yeah. Those aren't actually good. So we nearly had something with the play the movie, but it didn't work. So we're going to invent something else. And the important point is this kind of reasoning is what led people like Bernoulli to invent what we're about to invent. Right. So actually playing the movie, actually watching the system evolve, isn't enough. It doesn't work, but it gets close. It gets close. No work, no work, no work, work. Right, so, and if you want to think about the other way around, this one works, this one works, this one works, and this one, you know, works. Right, so we have to think about, think about our changes. So instead of thinking of pain, we're going to invent a new kind of displacement, and we're going to call that cause the movie. This guy is called a virtual displacement because it's not realistic. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the movie. We're free time. But I'm going to imagine that in this frozen state of time, I have this crazy superpower. Remember Rotation Man? Now this is the next one. This is the next superpower that uh, the physicists possess. We're going to be able to move things around on the lift floor or obeying the constraints at that instant in time, what the movie is for. There are rules, even for us, we cannot just dominate the universe overnight. We have rules. We are not allowed to violate the constraints at that time. So in this instance, 
Even though I caused the movie, the lift isn't moving, I'm allowed to move the particle only on its floor. I'm not allowed to lift it off the floor. I'm not allowed to violate the constraints. <coughs> so this is a new type of displacement, which is called a virtual displacement. Pause the movie, I call it a virtual displacement. Virtual in the sense that it's not real. doesn't really happen in real life. But as physicists, in our minds, we have superpowers. Those superpowers are we can pause the movie and move things around. And we denote it, just like we denoted a real infinitesimal displacement with dr, we denote these virtual displacements with delta r. Right, so we are going to pause the movie and move things around. But well, what happens? On the block of the slope, problem. Let's take away what happens when I play the movie. I've paused the movie. The slope is not moving, the block is not moving. Now I'm allowed to move the block however I like, provided that I do not violate the constraints. Well, which way does my little motion point? Down the slope, just like the wall. I'm allowed to move the thing up and down the slope. Feet on the hoop. I pause the movie. Um, so, all right, here's an interesting one, right? If the slope itself is a dynamical object, let's say I've got this block, it's heavy, the slope is also heavy, and I let them fall. What's going to happen? The slope will slide backwards whilst the block falls down. This is a classic example of the types of problems we'll solve with our new formalism. Basically, the, the, the slope itself moves that way whilst the block moves that way. Then if you play the movie, right, your little infinitesimal displacement would not really be straight down the slope anymore, right? Because the slope's moving something and the block's moving something. The total displacement's not perpendicular to the normal force. But if you play the movie here, uh, if you pause the movie and move things around, you're okay. Right. So let's do this one. Pause the movie, where can I move the bead? Well, I can't take it off the, the wire. I still can't do that. I've got superpowers, but they're not that strong. So I can move it up and down the wire. Well, that's fine. I can still do this. But this still seems to work the same way as it always did. Um, pause the movie here. I'm allowed to move the pendulum. I'm not allowed to stretch the pendulum, but I'm allowed to move it. Well, the virtual displacement is exactly the same as it was before. The advantage is when my constrained surface itself is moving. The advantage is here, in the case of the lift. Pause the movie. Does the lift move up and down? No. But I'm still allowed to move the particle around on the floor of the lift. So, this picture changes. These ones all stay the same. This one changes. I pause the movie. I'm not going to take away the pendulum because it's still not this. I pause the movie, the lift has to stay in the same place. Right. Okay. Well, with my powers, I'm now going to move the particle around on the floor of the lift while it stays in the same place. That's always something in the plane of the lift. Which way does the normal force point? But back in business, right? So we call this thing a virtual displacement. We can't very well call this other thing, but the moving of it, what the, what the force does in our imaginary world where we can pull the media and move it, a real thing. It's also virtual, and we call it virtual work. Virtual work. We write this thing as whatever force we're considering got delta r is the virtual work done by that force as we pause the movie and move the, the system in some small way in the paused. <coughs> right. That's the difference between a real displacement and a virtual displacement. The difference between real work and virtual work. It's useful to us. Why? Because we want to pin down the force of the constraint everywhere we can. 
We want to make them cry for mercy. We want to bring them to their knees. And one way to do that is to make a blanket derivative statement. Does no virtual work. Does no virtual work. Does no virtual work. The forces of constraint do no virtual work. They can do real work in some rare cases, but they never do virtual work. Well, we got them. We're about to show up. Constrained for space. Um, the force of constraint to go virtual work. We call that our fundamental postulate. How we will base everything else. Now it gets a bit more complicated than that. And I will briefly just outline to you. I've uploaded another set of notes from the internet, chapter two uh, notes, in which all these things are written very clearly. Um, and which certain derivations are done that I won't entirely touch on in class. And in particular amongst them is, we've only considered systems here on the board in which there was one thing moving, the block, the bead, the marble, or the fat man, whatever you want to say, the, those were the things that were moving in these instances. When there's more than one system, more than one particle in the system, for instance, when there's two particles, and I constrain them with some force of constraint, like there's a bar between them. We did this on Thursday, remember? We put bars between particles. Right, so when there's two things and there's a bar between them, that's a constraint, right? Uh, and you can think about the different kinds of virtual displacements you can do to the system. And the standard notes, you realize that this, the force of constraint here, the tension, can do a virtual work on this particle, and it can do a virtual work on this particle. But when you add those two virtual works together, you get zero. So that's a reasonable thing to take on faith at the moment, given that we've seen that virtual work is zero there, that in fact, in a case where there's lots of systems, there's no <coughs> net virtual work done by the force of I can make this postulate. And essentially, the virtual, virtual displacements and virtual work were constructed by Bernoulli um, in order to satisfy this result. That's why we made them, yeah? Can you please explain the virtual concept again? Right, so essentially, real work right, is force times displacement. We can think of a real infinitesimal displacement, playing the movie for a short time, letting this do its thing for a short time, seeing where did the particle go, and what part of the work in moving it there was done by this force. But we ran into trouble, because a force of constraint can do real work. So we invented a new thing, which we call the virtual displacement, which essentially was pausing the movie, don't let the lift move, but allow ourselves to make little displacements of the system within those constraints. Let us move the model inside the lift whilst time is frozen. We call that virtual displacement delta r. Right? It's essentially a normal displacement, except it is not over a time period. It's over an instant in time. It's not dependent on time. So it's a time independent little tiny displacement that doesn't really exist, but that we imagine in our heads that we can do. Now we ask the same question we asked before. We say, when I move this particle from here to here, but I've done it instantaneously, how much work was done by the various forces? Not that any real work was done, virtual work was done. It didn't really happen. So if I were to do that, what part of that motion could be attributed to different forces? The answer then is, well, something was pushing it this way, right? I went in, in frozen time and I moved it, and I applied a force to it. But certainly the normal force 